Okay, I, I call this leading yourself and leading others because my theme really is that in order to be an effective manager, you have to really be an effective leader. Um, people used to make a distinction between management, which was kind of administrative, getting the job done on a day-to-day -day basis, and leadership, which people used to say was more about creating a vision and making change. Now that's true, but increasingly in the modern world, in the 21st century, you can't really do the day-to-day -day management without some element of leading. There is so much change. People are having to upgrade their skills, learn new technology. So just in order to uh, keep the same operation functioning effectively and efficiently over a number of years, in fact, you will find you have to lead change just to do that. That was the first point. The second point, why yourself? Well, unless you can manage yourself, unless you have competencies uh, about managing your own time and your own efforts, then you will not find it possible to lead others. So you have to manage and lead yourself in order to manage and lead others. And that's really the theme of what I'll be talking about tonight. One way of looking at this is to think in terms of personal managerial competencies. Now we all know about competencies, organizational competencies, core competencies. <coughs> These ideas have been around for a while. What we are talking about tonight is competencies which the individual manager must master rather than those that are shared amongst a group or a team. Now an organization needs both. But you as individuals, if you want to progress your career, become more effective, there are some personal skills and competencies that you have to uh, master. One way of looking at this is think that there might be some, what we might call meta-competencies. That's overarching competencies. The competencies which lead to other skills and knowledge. So, if you think of an MBA program, for instance, these meta competencies here will be some of the areas that you will be acquiring knowledge about in doing your MBA subjects or equivalent master's uh, programs in management or business. Basic business numeracy. Okay. Uh, effective managers have to be able to do the financial stuff and the project management stuff the number stuff. You really have to be able to uh, understand how budgets work. And if you want to be a general manager, you have to understand how finance uh, and money works at the organizational and departmental level. Profit and loss account, all that good stuff, the balance book, everything. Okay? So you cannot be an effective manager, even a human resource manager as I was. You cannot really be an effective manager unless you have basic business numeracy. You don't have to be a mathematician, you don't have to be Albert Einstein, but you have to be able to understand what the accountant is telling you or what your customers are telling you or what your suppliers are telling you so you can make an informed decision. Communication. We'll come back to that later tonight, but communication is absolutely essential. When I was doing research for my doctorate, I uh, was interviewing people uh, in Hewlett-Packard, which are still around, but in those days, tells you how long ago it is since I did my doctorate, but in those days Hewlett-Packard were like the apple of today. Bright engineers really wanted to work for them. You know, their problem was turning away people when they advertised for a vacancy. And Hewlett-Packard were the company that invented the phrase management by walking about which has become a bit of a cliche. But their argument was that when they first set up companies in Britain and in Scotland, they discovered that the British managerial culture of those days was very old fashioned. And the manager would be seen as a superior sort of person who had an office of his own, and it would always be his, not hers in those days. And it was very easy, if you have that very hierarchical mentality, it's very easy for the manager to lose touch with the people that he or she is supposed to be managing. 
So Hewlett Packard had a culture whereby managers were encouraged to get out and physically speak to and talk to all the people that they were responsible for. And it sounds like common sense, but it's, it's, it's remarkable how in many organizations that hierarchical ossification can take place. So I always try and remember stu remind students that communication is central to effective management. You may have the greatest strategy in the world, or the greatest plan for production, for improving efficiency, for motivating people. You may have the greatest plan in your head. If you can't communicate that to people, it's never going to be translated into action. So managers have to be able to communicate. Okay. Interpersonal competencies, and what we mean by that, we'll again explain in a bit more detail <coughs> shortly. But it's how you manage the interaction with your people, how you understand them, how you influence them, and so forth. <coughs> Decision making. Okay. Um, President Truman, <coughs> who was President of the United States uh, in 1946, apparently his first day in the Oval Office, he put a sign up saying the buck stops here. Okay. So he was saying, okay, I'm the president, I've got to finally make the decisions. But really for all managers, the buck, the responsibility stops with you. You have to make decisions. That's one of the things that makes management so difficult because you don't have an endless amount of time and that means you very often don't have all the information you would like. You don't have perfect information. So you're making difficult decisions with imperfect information in real time. And that's not easy. But you can improve your skill in doing that. You can make sure that you have the best information you can get. You can make sure that you have covered as many bases as possible and that you make the decision in due time. So these are all skills or competencies that can be improved. Whenever we use the term competence or skill, we're implying that it can be taught to an extent and that it can be improved to an extent. Okay. Organizing and planning, it sounds obvious, but again, all managers, even those who deal with fairly uh, people-oriented issues like human resource management or welfare, they have to be able to organize and plan work. As soon as you're leading a team, you're responsible for their work. So you have to be able to organize and plan it, help these people to organize and plan. If you don't have a route map, you can't really get to your destination and you can't help other people get to their destination. Leadership and influencing, and again we'll talk specifically about that. Um, the great German sociologist Max Weber was one of the first to write over a hundred years ago about authority and leadership and influence. And Weber was intrigued by why people do what they're told. Now, in some situations like uh, a war or something, the commanding officer could pull out a gun and say, if you don't do what I do, I'm going to shoot you. Okay? You can't do that in commercial life, or you shouldn't be doing that in commercial life. But as Weber realized, even an army, even in, a, in an actual war, it can't function if every time an officer gives a command, he has to pull out his gun and threaten people. So pe why do people accept authority? Why do people accept what you're, they're being asked to do? And yet, in organizations, that's what usually happens. That's what has to happen. Okay? So this question of leadership, which can be defined as making people do things which they otherwise wouldn't do, not because they're perhaps hostile to it, perhaps it's just inertia. But as managers, I guess you know this, your people often know what to do, but they never get around to it. You've got to give them leadership. You've got to influence them to make something happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. And that's one of the great issues about leading people. 
Now self-awareness and reflection, and that may be a surprise to some people, because we tend to think of managers as being uh, a bit like military leaders, a bit like generals, tough guys, or tough ladies, who um, are very extrovert and uh, very resilient. Um, we don't often associate that sort of person with being reflective or having self-awareness, but in fact, good managers only learn from reflection. And there is the old <coughs> adage which goes back to the ancient Greeks that the first step to knowledge is know thyself. So effective managers self-reflect. Okay? And this is where keeping learning journals or logs or even little diaries helps your later development. You can look back and say, I wonder why that didn't work, or I wonder why that did work. Would I do this the same way? What have I learned from this? So one of these uh, meta competencies is self-awareness and reflection. So the successful manager has this set of skills or competencies, and they lead to other competencies. By using these, you can do the other managerial stuff, which perhaps looks more like a description of what we think of as managerial work. <coughs> Gathering data, making budgets, presenting, formal report writing, scheduling work of others, time management, and so forth. But really, what we're seeing is these all stem from having these basic or meta competencies. Okay? And so when you get to some really complicated stuff, okay, like building teams, motivating teams, bargaining, negotiating, resolving disputes, developing others, then this is where this forms a basis. If you improve your competence at that level, it equips you to deal with these more complicated problems and issues, which as managers you have to deal with. Cobb is an American psychologist who was interested specifically in how professionals, like managers, learn. And he thought, he thought to himself, when you look at professionals like doctors or architects or engineers or managers, their formal education tends to end relatively early in their career. So someone graduates from medical school in their early 20s or mid-twenties. A manager does his MBA in his, typically in his 30s or early 40s. But that still gives at least 25 years of useful life. Now what does a manager do or the architect do? You, you, you only do it, believe me, you only do an MBA once if you're a normal sort of person. Uh, so how do you continue to learn? And so Cobb investigated this and he devised this model, the Cobb learning cycle. He said, how professionals continue to learn by doing the job, by practicing their profession, is this cycle. It starts with experience. Something happens, a problem usually, an issue to be dealt with, or something unexpected happens, which makes an impact. You realize you're experiencing something. That's unusual. This is new, or this is a new problem, or this is a new <coughs> challenge for me. And people observe and reflect upon this. How does this work? Why is this different? Why is this situation different? Why are our suppliers suddenly changing their behavior? What's the explanation for this? So you try and find this explanation, some general explanation. Oh, it's because the supply chain dynamics have changed because firms are onshoring, whereas previously they were offshoring, for example. But there's some explanation. And then they test that out. Is that really what's happening? Let's look at some other industry or some other branch of the organization. And if your concept survives the test, you've learned something. And you're better prepared to then cope with this new situation when it arises. And Kolb argues very persuasively <coughs> that even if we're not always conscious of this, this is how professionals continue to learn throughout their career. Drawing from 
the actual experience. So if someone does an MBA or another master's in, in business, then they learn a lot of knowledge, which then provides them with the basis to continue to learn for the rest of their career, if they're to be successful. So this comes back to what we said about self-reflection and self-awareness being one of these meta-competencies or basic competencies. Self-awareness. Now, one of the uh, fashionable phrases in the last 15 years is emotional intelligence, which sounds like a bit of a contradiction. Intelligence, that sounds rational. Emotional, that sounds irrational. Uh, but we'll, 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 we'll talk uh, in a little bit in the next slide about what exactly what we mean by emotional intelligence. But that's one of this business of self-awareness. What are your strengths and weaknesses? What are your qualities? What sort of manager and what sort of person are you? And reflection is this crucial competence in self-awareness, this reflection that Cole talked about. Two types what Cobb called, called reflection in action. Reflection when you're actually doing the job or dealing with the problem. <coughs> and then later, reflection on action. And that's where learning logs or work diaries or just accounts file looking back at the issues you've dealt with can be so helpful. Um, when a project is completed, usually you're under pressure to thank everybody, perhaps take them out for a drink, have a meal, short celebration, bang, we're on to the next problem. But wise organizations say to project managers, always have a fairly extensive debriefing. What have we learned from this project? What three things have we learned that we can pass on or retain ourselves for the next project? What have we learned? Reflecting after the event. And we mentioned Cobb's learning cycle. And if we go back to uh, these four stages, experience, ob observation, reflection, forming concepts, and testing concepts, psychologists building on the work of Cobb found that people tend to learn in different ways. People have preferred ways of learning. And linking this to the Cobb cycle, People have been labeled activists, people who learn from taking action. Reflectors, people who learn more from reflecting. People who learn most from theorizing. Or people who take this pragmatic action, people who learn from putting things into action in a pragmatic, not so theoretical way. But remember, you've got to complete this learning cycle in order to really have true learning. So whatever style is preferred, you still must go through these other stages. So again, self-awareness is important. If you know that you're really an activist and you learn most from taking action and doing things, that's great. You're going to learn from that faster than any other way. But remember, you have to also go through these other stages before your learning will be complete. Okay? So that's the idea of learning styles. Um, a good MBA program or management education program will recognize that people learn in different ways. Okay. Um, so people learn, get their path through the uh, program of learning in a way that suits them. And so a wise MBA program, an MBA program which has been devised with wisdom, will give students space to approach that their own way. Emotional intelligence, made famous by Goldman, who uh, was really more of a journalist than a, a psychologist. And he was actually basing his work on the work of two Americans, Salovey and Meyer, from 1990. And that's quite a nice definition they give of social intelli emotional intelligence, a form of social intelligence that involves the ability to monitor your own and others' feelings and emotions, to discriminate amongst them, 
and to use this information to guide one's thinking and action. That's quite a mouthful, okay? There's a lot in there. But it's social. It's about understanding other people. And the term psychologists use in English is empathy, empathize, standing inside someone else's shoes. And that's something which we're all born with. Children are very good at empathizing. And as adults, we, if, we don't, if we don't take care, we lose this ability as adults. We become too focused, too egotistical, too concerned with ourselves. Um, we view our people as resources to be moved around and we don't understand what it's like. So the good manager has this empathy or this emotional intelligence. So when you ask someone to do something particularly difficult, you understand you're asking them to do something that they, they, they don't perhaps want to do and perhaps they need some help to do it or they need some encouragement. Or perhaps you have a very good member of staff whom you're trying to develop and they lack the confidence. They appear quite confident but really they lack the confidence. Well, if you have the, the sort of empathy that a good manager has, then you should understand that and be able to give them support and guidance so that they can fulfill their potential. Okay? Um, I've always thought it was a, a, not a terribly good name because it sounds like a contradiction, emotional intelligence. It sounds like it's either devaluing emotion or is devaluing intelligence. But it's a, it's a label we're stuck with, I'm afraid. A better technical term is non-cognitive aspects of intelligence. Okay, but it is to do with intelligence, but it's intelligence that works in the non-cognitive way. It's not the highly rational thinking like doing mathematics or finance or something. Um, this is a, a good website, uh, eiconsortium.org. And in fact, in your pack, you'll find something which I adapted from them called a Personal Emotional Intelligence Competence Inventory. And if you're interested, sometime after the talk, you could complete that, you score it, and there's an explanation sheet there, okay, on the back. So don't look at the scoring sheet before you... <laughs> and like all these tests, if you cheat, you're only <coughs> cheating yourself. Okay? But don't take this too seriously. It's just really to make you reflect about these issues. It operates in this area here. It gives you some idea of personal emotional competence. Because one of the themes tonight was personal competencies, personal managerial competencies. Um, Self-awareness, self-regulation, self-motivation. And if we look down these, this column here of components, funny how so many of them would come up in any sort of list of what would be effective management. Self-awareness, awareness of your own emotions, accurate self-assessment, self-confidence. Okay? If you're to lead people, you have to believe in yourself. Okay? Self-regulation. You have to be able to control your own emotions. Um, you may be extremely angry with a member of your staff, perhaps completely justifiably. Okay? And in another non-work context, you'd be quite justified in slapping them around or <laughs> Or, or shouting at them. But as a manager, you can't do it. You have to control your own emotions and say, this behavior is unacceptable. It's unacceptable because, such and such. And you have to change, and we have to help you change. So the good manager is aware of their emotions, but is able to control their emotions. <coughs> you can't afford the luxury of shouting back at people who annoy you, okay? Because you lose your own authority, you lose your self-respect. You have to control your emotions. Self-motivation. Now, I don't think I have to labor that point in this particular audience. If you're interested in developing yourself, then you are self-motivating. If the thought of doing an MBA or an MSc has seriously <coughs> crossed your mind, then you are probably motivated 
to improve yourself and improve your career. So I don't think your motivation is probably at issue here. Um, commitment initiative, and this is interesting, optimism. You know, uh, someone once said, if, if you're not making money or having fun, what the heck are you doing doing your job? Okay, now not everyone has to make money. Most of us need to make enough. But if, you, if you're not having fun or making money, go and find something that will give you one of these things. Okay, so you need to be optimistic about what you're doing. I mean, it's, there's a lot of Monday mornings, as someone once said to me, there's a lot of Monday mornings between the age of 19 and 65. And this person, who's actually a relative of mine, she was a very successful school teacher, and she probably got more job satisfaction than almost anyone else I've ever met. But Myra still found Monday mornings sometimes a bit difficult. So you have to be optimistic. You have to find a niche, find an approach, so that your work turns you on rather than turns you off. Okay? Otherwise, you're not going to make the effort. Um, has everyone heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Anyone not heard of that? Okay, most people have. And you know the top of that pyramid is self-actualization, where people can identify with their work and say, I'm getting fulfillment out of this, this is ongoing. One manager said, one American manager famously said, his job, quote, is to get my guys to self-actualize in the plant rather than on the golf course on a Saturday. It's a very wise saying because what Maslow tells us is that there's a human need to seek motivation and self-actualization. And if you don't get it at work, you'll find it outside. So the manager's job is to try and harness that basic need for self-actualization and get people to get that motivation at work. And then you're getting somewhere. Okay? importance of setting your personal goals. Where do you want to be in five years time? Okay. And what do you have to do to get there? What are the signposts that you'll set, the milestones by which you know if you're achieving your goal? And of course we all know the acronym SMART, specific, measurable, assignable, realistic, time bound. Very easy to say, a little bit more difficult to put into practice, especially if it involves other people. But if you really can make your goals and your staff, your employees' goals, smart in that sense, specific, people know exactly, you know exactly what you're trying to achieve, it's measurable, perhaps not down to the tenth decimal place. One of the problems with a lot of quality improvement programs like Six Sigma is they were fantastic when you're dealing with mechanical engineering, things you could measure very precisely and drop on your foot. Not so good when it comes to service stuff. So measurement perhaps can't be very exact always, but you should always be able to make a decision. Have we succeeded in reaching that goal or have we not? At a minimum you should be able to say that. And it's helpful if you can grade that and say how close have we come to it? How far away are we from it? So this idea of measurable, not just an aspiration, but has the performance actually been achieved, again, is central to this. Oops, sorry, assignable. In other words, if this is the, if you're talking about your own goals and it's assignable to you and you alone, what you have to achieve. If it's a goal that your team has to achieve, then who or what group of people, what combination of people are actually going to have to do this, okay? Realistic. It's realistic to say you can get your MBA in three years, part-time. It's maybe not realistic to say I'll do it in a year and I'll take this promoted post which is going to move me and my family from Hong Kong to Canada and I can do all that in a year. Well, maybe. <laughs> so you have to be realistic. Um, and time-bound. By what date are you going to achieve that? Okay. And if you can really clarify these points, then that simple and overused acronym can become a very important tool. But believe me, it's hard work, 
to make it work accurately, but it is so profitable when you can. You need to prioritise your own work. Okay. Again, going back, if I can go back to Hewlett Packard, I, I, at one point I was interviewing these senior managers and saying, what does it take to be successful around here? And one of them said, well, we talk about the critical few. And what it really was was a form of management by objectives. We all know management by objectives, set goals and all the rest of it. What they realized at Hewlett Packard when they were dealing with highly professional engineers and asking them to do highly creative work <coughs> was that, in fact, people have to do dozens of things. Okay? If you were to list the objectives of a senior consulting engineer in Hewlett Packard, it would fill that wall. But, and this was the point, but successful managers had to know which of the 200 items which theoretically this person is responsible for, what are the three or four or five or at most six which have to be achieved? And if these are achieved, we'll make the other 194 fall into place, the critical few. This is talking about prioritizing, having the experience, the confidence, the knowledge to say, I know I have to deal with these things, but these are the critical few. And that's, that's a phrase I've, I've never forgotten. I've always found it very useful. Critical few. Critical is important. Few, because really there are always just a small number of things which absolutely must be done. And that's how you set your priorities. Importance of time management, which is kind of the same thing. Managing your time, setting your priorities. If you can't manage your own time, it's difficult to manage other people because you're essentially trying to manage their time when you can't manage yours. And I once said to a student that I had discovered the secret of life. And I think I have. And it is time management. Because if you can manage your time, you can work, you can develop yourself, you can do your MBA, and you can still see your family, and you can improve your golf, okay? And you can write your novel, <coughs> or you can climb, the, whatever it is you want to do. But you can't achieve everything you want to achieve unless you can manage your time. Okay? Understand the role of assertiveness in self-management. You do sometimes have to take hard-nosed decisions and be assertive, but of course we have to remind ourselves that assertion is not aggression. And sometimes assertion is negative. No, no, I'm not going to do that. No, it's not appropriate for me to take that role. Okay? So you have to be able to assert yourself in order to manage yourself effectively. Communication. Also what we might call interpersonal skills. Now obviously there's formal communication. Emails, reports, letters, etc. So you need to have good language skills. You don't have to be Shakespeare. You don't have to write deathless poetry. But you need to be able to communicate clearly, accurately, concisely. But also, in communication, remember, these activities are about communication. Interviewing. Interviewing staff for recruitment, for promotion. Interviewing clients interviewing suppliers, okay? interviewing government people who can put a spanner in your operation um, if they don't understand exactly what you need them to understand. Discussion leading, getting your team to discuss a problem without imposing a solution, but again, getting them to bring their knowledge to the table. That's communication. Coaching, counseling, all that's all formal communication in a way. Also less formally but still about communication and interpersonal skills, building mutual understanding, active listening, quite a difficult skill active listening. People can tell when you've switched off and you've made your decision. Okay, When you're under pressure and time and you think you know the answer anyway, it's sometimes very easy to cut people off and you're not actually listening to what they're saying. So you have to cultivate this uh, idea of 
letting people have their say, actively listening to what they're saying, not just running through the motions. And it's not easy for us because people like us, professionals, managerial types, are used to being decisive, assertive, and all the rest of it. And we're used to being right. So we don't always listen to the person who might save us from making a big mistake. <laughs> Encouraging communication from others. <coughs> and in some cultures, that's quite important. In some cultures, people are conditioned from a very early age to listen to their seniors. Okay? But actually, in today's world, nobody has all the answers. In the knowledge economy, you need everybody to bring something to the table. So sometimes in some cultures, Scottish culture is still a bit like that. Sometimes managers of Scottish engineers have said to me, I know these guys have the solution, but they won't speak to me. I have to get them <coughs> to believe in themselves and to believe it's all right to tell me when I'm wrong, but they have the solution, not me. Giving feedback to others, absolutely crucial. Crucial in motivation, crucial in managing the performance of other people. If you don't tell people how they're performing, good or bad or indifferent, then they don't know. So you can't expect them to improve if they don't know that they're underperforming. So giving feedback is absolutely crucial. Giving negative feedback is one of the hardest things you'll do as a manager saying, look, Bill, I know you've been working hard, but this isn't working yet. Okay, you've got to, we've got to think this through again. We've got to approach it again because the performance is not what we require. But if you don't tell Bill that, two things happen. One, Bill just goes on his merry way and you never get the performance you need. <coughs> and secondly, Bill believes that he's doing okay. So the longer you leave it, the harder it becomes. Because Bill says, why are you telling me now? I've been working for you for six months or nine months or a year. I've been doing this. You seem to be happy. Why are you now telling me it's not enough? So you really have to give feedback at the appropriate time as soon as possible. And that's about communication. Okay? That's, there's no point in you walking around with the knowledge in your head, Bill's not performing. If you don't let him know, he doesn't know. So nothing happens. And for managers, always remember the importance of face-to-face -face communication. Work is a human social thing, unless you happen to be the one guy in a robotic plant. Now, moving on to influencing others, leading and influencing others, um, there are sources of power that people can have. Okay? And can perhaps acquire. Now, some of these come with the position. You've been appointed as team leader. You've got that position. Now, that can give you three powerful areas of influence. Okay? The power to reward people. Do a good job and you can give them a bonus or a promotion. Okay? Or at least give them a positive um, assessment at, at their next appraisal. Okay? Converse of that is coercive. You may have the power to punish them, discipline them if they're not performing well. And this can take the, the form just of withholding some reward that they would otherwise get. So if you have these things, power of reward, power of coercion, you're in a powerful way, effective situation to make people do what you want, to influence them. Okay? It's rather bare knuckle, but it's, it's a fact. If you have these sources of power, then you can influence people. The third one is this idea of legitimacy. And it's very important. People have to accept that you're the boss. Okay, that you're capable of being the boss, that it's right to accept your authority. This was the issue that Max Weber was talking about. I mentioned that at the start of the lecture. Why do people do what they're told? Why do people 
come to Hong Kong and give a lecture, okay? Uh, because my boss asked me to. Right? Not really, I wanted to as well. But if I hadn't wanted to, I'd have had to do it. But why should I listen to my boss? You know? um, if the head of uh, School of Engineering said, Ian, I want you to go halfway across the world and talk to people, I said, no, oh, go away. I want to play golf that week. Okay? You're not my boss. Whereas if Professor Lumsden, as head of Edinburgh Business School, says, I would like you to do this, Ian, well, you're the boss. See what I mean? To me, Professor London's authority is legitimate. He's got the right to ask me to do that. And he's not asking me to do anything unreasonable. Far from it. He's asking me to do something which I knew I would enjoy. I knew it would be part of my job. But the fundamental thing is he had the right to ask me to do it. Whereas the head of civil engineering at Harriet Watt, why should I do what he says? Okay? So I wouldn't regard that as being legitimate authority. So people need this legitimacy. And that's the third part of that positional aspect of, uh, of bases of power. Then there are two others which are really personal. Okay. One, we'll look at this one here first, expert. If people know that you have expert knowledge, that gives you power. Um, if the IT guy says, you can't do that with the computer, I just say, okay, <laughs> I, I'm not going to argue with him. What do I know about computing? You know? So um, expert knowledge gives you power. You know more than someone else. Well, sometimes it's called sapiential knowledge. So, sorry, sapiential power. The power that comes from knowledge. Okay? And lastly, this idea of referent power, sometimes called charisma. Do you know the English term charisma? It's like a kind of magical aura. Great leaders have it. Okay? Sometimes great business leaders have it. Um, and this referent or charismatic power is a purely personal thing, and it's built up um, by being seen to be successful, sometimes being seen to be boldly successful. Many political figures achieve this. They do something bold, they change their country in some way that people see as positive, or they perhaps save their country from a, different, a difficult, dangerous situation, <coughs> and then do it. In, in England, for my parents' generation, for my father's generation, Winston Churchill was like that, because he helped Britain stand against Germany in the Second World War when they thought they were going to lose. And so thereafter, for the rest of his life, Winston Churchill was this larger than life figure for that generation of British people. And referent power is very, very powerful. And it, it, mean, it, it works because people say, I want to be like you. Okay? Um, I'll follow you. So the leader or the manager with this referent power or charismatic power finds it very easy to get people to do things. He says, follow me and people follow. But like a religious leader or a political leader. And it's because people have this um, great respect. They see them as being more than ordinary. They're almost superhuman. You know? That's a bit of an exaggeration, but they're seen as being out of the ordinary. And therefore always right. And of course, that's one of the dangers of charismatic leadership, is that it disarms our rational capacity. Most managers, if they had some bold plan, we would try and submit it to normal rational analysis and say, the old boy's lost it here, this isn't going to work. But someone with charisma or referent power, people suspend that critical faculty. And sometimes that leads to disaster. So the referent power can be irrational. But these are, if you like, the five sources of... The more sources of the more of these five you have as a manager, the easier it is for you to influence people. And by influence, we mean getting to do something which otherwise wouldn't happen. Okay? 
not necessarily because people are against it, but just because of inertia or lack of interest or lack of understanding or lack of belief. So the organization can give you these, but you have to acquire these. And organizations can sometimes get this wrong. Organizations can sometimes put people in a position, giving them legitimate power, but not allowing them to use rewards or punishments, and perhaps in an area where they don't have expert knowledge or expert reputation. And quite often managers in the public sector, government offices and so forth, where pay is set, uh, and, and the manager can't award bonuses or withhold bonuses, then these managers can be in a very difficult position because they don't have the tools they need, they don't have the basis of power to influence people. Okay. <coughs> so, as successful managers, you want to work for organisations which will correctly give you this, and then you build up your expertise and that hopefully starts over time, you build a reputation as being a successful manager who can get things done, who's successful, who people want to work with because it helps their careers, and they acquire this referent or charismatic aspect. And then <coughs> you've really got all the tools in the toolbox to influence people. Okay. Leadership. Now, leadership is a, is, has been studied for over 100 years <coughs> uh, without, shall we say, a definitive answer. But we know a lot about it. And the most recent thinking on leadership tends to uh, take what um, might be called a, a combination of the behavioural and the contingent views. And it talks about styles. And Goleman, the same man who wrote about emotional intelligence, based on his ideas of emotional intelligence, um, came up with six styles, which he said good managers should all try to acquire. Okay? And it depended on the situation, that's the contingent part, depending on what the problem actually was. So, for instance, there are situations in a crisis, say, or dealing with very problematic people, where the most effective style is actually to be rather coercive, to demand compliance. In other words, do what I tell you. Okay? There are situations where a manager has to be prepared to say that and mean it. Okay? Just do it. I'm not discussing it anymore. We're not going to have any more democratic decision making. I'm sorry, this is a crisis. This is important. If we don't do this, the factory closes tomorrow and our creditors move in. So do it. And the competence you need that is a drive to achieve, need to achieve yourself, and also self-control. Note the self-control. Anyone can bark orders, but unless you have a reputation for being controlled, then people won't really believe you if you start saying, do this now. They'll say it, they think it's just an act. Whereas if they know that you only say that when you actually mean it, then it has authority. Um, Slightly less uh, uh, aggressive, if you like, authoritative. Come with me. This mobilizes people. It's when a new vision or direction is needed. Change management. One step away from the absolute crisis management. But when some major change or cultural change is, has to be driven from the top, then you need this rather authoritative style. You need to say to people, I'm going here. You must come with me. Come with me now. Okay. And for that, you need self-confidence, and you have to be able to act as a catalyst for change. Okay? Now, in another situation, perhaps after you've made these culture changes, the needs of the leader or the manager change again. Perhaps heel wounds motivate people under stress. Perhaps you've had to have downsizing, and you've had to get rid of people. That's the easy part. Okay? I'm not saying it isn't sometimes done wrongly, but that's a relatively easy part, identifying the people you need to get rid of. The hard bit is what you do with the people who are left. Because, thank you, because 
if you see your colleague being made redundant and you're not, your first thought is going to be, I wonder if I'll be next. And then you think, I'd better start looking for something and go before they get rid of me. And that can be a problem for the organization because you are the people they want to keep. Otherwise, you'd have got rid, rid of you the first time. So the very people you want to keep, you can unwittingly drive away unless you can get through this stage, heal the wounds, motivate people when they're stressed, give them a vision of the future that is going to work. And for that, you don't need a coercive style. You need a style that says, come on, we're all in this together now. We've gone through the bloodletting. Now is the time to um, pull together and make the organization a success again. So people can come out of that dip of depression. Another, another uh, situation, I think you can see this is something of a, a, a spectrum here, from the rather aggressive to the much uh, more empathizing uh, coaching. But you can see these, uh, these other things. When perhaps you're trying to build teams, or you want to get consensus, then your style is more democratic. And instead of saying, come with me or do what I say, you're saying, what do you think about this? Let's get your knowledge on the table. We need your knowledge to help build this team. We need your expertise. We want you to work with us. When you want to get fast results from a motivated team, you have to up the performance, put your foot on the gas to change the metaphor. Then um, you have to say, look, I'll lead the way here. Do as I do, and let's do it now. I'll show you how to raise standards. coaching and developing people, you need this coaching style. Empathy and self-awareness is what you need for that. And interesting, the great management writer Peter Drucker, now no longer with us, but for about 60 years he was one of the most interesting writers in management. And back in the middle of last century, over, over 70 years ago, he said one of the key responsibilities of all managers is to develop other managers. And what he meant was the organization should always be growing the stock of managerial talent for the future. So as a manager, in addition to your day-to-day uh, -day processes and your long-term changes and your leadership, an important part of your role is to develop younger people, really to be able to do your job in the future and to help the organization in that way. Now what was interesting is that Goldman said these are the styles that every <coughs> effective manager should be able to adopt, at least to some level. Now we can't get away from things like personalities completely. Some people are happier at this end, the coercive, authoritative, self-confident end. Other people are happier at the democratic, affiliative, coaching end. Okay, and that may be largely a personality issue. But what Goldman argues is that because we're talking about styles, leadership, competencies, then everyone, regardless of their personality, should be able to at least be competent in each of these styles. So the person who is really happiest doing coaching can still learn to be authoritative with training and support and experience and vice versa. And the analogy Goldman gave was it's like a professional golfer has 14 clubs in his bag. Okay? And nobody is ideal at all, even when Tiger Woods was at his peak his driving was always a bit suspect, okay? He could hit the ball a country mile, but even when he was at his best, it didn't always go straight. Um, so, but he had to be sufficiently confident to try and keep it on the fairway often enough so he could use his real strength, which was the middle irons and then his, his, his classic short game and putting. But it, and if he, there was no point being the best putter in the world if he couldn't get onto the green in enough strokes. So that was the analogy. You can tell Goldman's an American using a golf analogy. But that was his analogy. These are like clubs in a, a, a golfer's golf bag. 
and you have to be able to hit the ball with each club, okay, at least competently. Some you'll be just naturally easier with than others. And from the organization's point of view, we have to support our managers so that they can learn these styles.